Thank you for coming to our session. Um, there's so many great choices. I selected five different things I wanted to be at right now, too. So thank you for being at this one. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Kathy Tuttle. I'm the director of an, uh, a street safety coalition in, in Seattle called Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And uh, we have 20 local groups that work on street safety improvements and advocacy uh, from the kind of the micro level, uh, hyper local neighborhood perspective. And we're going to be presenting a case study of one of the projects that we worked on recently. And then we have some very difficult questions that we'd love to get some feedback from you because we haven't figured out the answers to them. And I think a, a discussion among this group would be very much in order. So again, I'm Kathy, and this is? Hi, again, thanks for coming. My name is Phyllis Porter. I'm the community, community engagement coordinator for Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And we're going to talk a little bit farther about the coalition group, one of the local coalition groups, Greenway Valley Greenways, which I'm the leader of. And so we're going to talk how Seattle uh, Neighborhood Greenways has given us their expertise on making things happen in the Rainier Valley community. So again, I, I already summarized what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be talking about one case study and then talking about questions that came out of that case study that we hope can be applied not just to our city, but to all of our cities. So Rainier Avenue South is by far Seattle's most dangerous street. Uh, it has about three times the uh, injuries, collisions, fatalities of any other street in Seattle. It's also a principal arterial and a major, it's not supposed to be a freight route, but it ends up being a freight route and, a, um, and also an emergency response route. Uh, what we worked on in the Rainier community, again, we have local groups all over the place, but we focus a lot of our attention on, on communities that need extra help, uh, that are underserved and need a lot of extra advocacy work from, from our paid staff perspective. And so we looked at a four mile stretch of Rainier Avenue South and that's what we've been focusing on for the last couple of years in trying to get some street safety improvements there. Uh, again, I said the, the numbers are appalling on the stretch of Rainier Avenue South. Uh, in the last three years you can see there's over a thousand collisions and 630 injuries along the stretch of road. And when we talk about injuries too, we always like say, oh, you know, it's an injury, but, it, but these injuries are life-changing injuries. These are things where people are hospitalized, where they take years to recover, and where their families also take years to recover, if they recover at all. And then there are two fatalities as well. You can see the just appalling numbers along this street. So this is also this is also the area down here in purple is the southeast end of Seattle, the area which we will be talking about. At the upper part is North Seattle. And if you look at the colors, the darker part of purple in the purple area is measured on the low income population. This is the population, social, economic, uh, community level is a lot less than those that on the north side. Also, this is the area where you see the highest rate of diabetes, health problems, and so we're focusing on that community. Here's just one of the pictures of the one of the many 1,243 crashes that have happened over the last three years. Thank God for this day there was no fatalities. There were a few injuries. If you look at the two cars that were parked, actually this car in the back, there were actually two people sitting in that car at the time of the incident. Also the car, the one here, uh, the one that did all the damage, this car actually had to be injected by the fire department. They actually had to use the dogs of life to pull this person out of that car. Secondly, we have another story, uh, Carol Cop Salon. Uh, I was a hit miss victim that day. I was walking down Rainier Avenue, and I could see this car. First of all, I stopped at this little restaurant. I thought I was going to have lunch. I saw three people sitting at the table, and I decided I've already had grief this week. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep it moving. As I continued to walk down the street, <laughs> I crossed over uh, the street onto the sidewalk, and I saw this SUV coming directly at me. The only thing I could do was jump to your left. She hit a pole that was directly in front of me. The top, pole, the top portion of the pole went into this building here, Kara Pop. And the second part of that, the bottom one part of that pole, it splattered and it hit my thigh. And out of, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. The only thing I could do was just turn around. And I literally saw this 
this SUV going to the Caracal Salon, and it continued through the salon over into the restaurant and pinned those three people down that I had just seen, mother, daughter, and father. Uh, the great thing is the entire community just started to run to help the car that was fired. But this is just another really, really bad collision that happens on Rainier Avenue. And this is not the only uh, uh, car running into building on Rainier Avenue, is it? No. How many have happened in the last couple of years? The last couple of years, there's, I don't have the exact number here, but there has been, I know more than I can put on this finger. <laughs> more than I can put on this finger. Just Okay, this was on one block. Okay, one block north of that, there was another car that went into a nail salon. We met with Seattle Department of Transportation to have a community meeting about this. And on my way to the community meeting, there was another car that went into a store on Rainier Avenue. So it's almost like an everyday thing. Who hit, what building got hit today? So working with SDOT and doing our community, we were able to make some changes, but we're not going to say that good part to last. Uh, so we decided no more, no more. We're tired of our community being afraid to walk on the sidewalk. We're tired of being afraid to just be out in the community, whether we're walking, we're going to the bank, we're going to the store. So we got with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and they loaned us their expertise, or gave us their expertise on how to build a powerful, a powerful campaign. We wanted enforcement, 25 miles per hour along Rainer Avenue, the corridor, and we also asked for 20 miles per hour in the urban villages. That's the Hillman City, Columbia City, and Rainer Beach. Uh, we also want a safe and dignified crosswalks. And the last one, of course, we want a safe place just so we can walk and bike. So in order to do this, we had to, we had to talk to the community. So we framed this conversation with the media. We had the media come out. We had the community come out. We wanted to talk to the community, talk to those people that aren't normally talking to city council, that are not uh, commonly talking to city government. And we also wanted to hear from the victims, from the victims' family of the people that were involved in, coll in collisions. So this next, this next uh, slide shows the community on that day. We talked to, as you see, community leaders, local leaders, city officials, and we had to inform them of the things that were going on. I'm going to give you two examples. We had a seven-year-old girl walking hand-in-hand -hand with her sister across, in a crosswalk on the way to the Boys and Girls Club to have, a tour, to have a tour session. A car came from nowhere, hit, struck her, and left her, ran over her, and left her for dead in the crosswalk. She suffered a broken pelvis, a broken arm, a broken leg, and also a head injury. She was in a coma. That's not the only one. We had a 15-year-old, Trayvon. Trayvon had a TBI, traumatic brain injury. It left him with the inability to speak, full synthesis, and also the inability to walk. He was in a coma for 73 days and on life support. So we said, no more, we've had enough. So we moved on to, what are we gonna do about it? We got the community together, we have the news media here, so we need to do something. So, Radio Bell and Greenways and the community decided to have a day of action. Two parts. We had a crosswalk protest and a get well soon. We felt like the street was sick. So we opened up on the corner of that last accident that I showed you guys, where the car ran into the salon. And we bought this car, we made the car, we put it out, and the community came up and they signed it. And then we had, over here to the left, we had City Council Harold come out, and he backed us in uh, making Rainier Avenue safer with the rechannelization. We also had, right in here, you see that picture there? This is the seven-year-old girl. This one. And she's standing, like, right here. Somewhere over there. So the, no, she was actually holding the sign. She's right behind the sign. That's Daytona. She actually, now of course, I, I, you know, I kind of spoiled a surprise. She's walking, she's talking. I went to visit, she ran down the stairs. I didn't know what condition she was in, and I heard the trampling of feet coming down the stairs. And she came around and I'm like, oh my God. I talked with her, she doesn't remember the accident. She's in school, she's a straight A student, she's doing very well. And one more thing, I just got some great news regarding the 15 year old, I talked to his mother like three days ago. He is learning to walk. 
He's in school. He's doing better. But most surprisingly, something she told me two days ago, he is now a father of a two-year-old child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, remarkable. So, every day we just reached out to the community. Uh, we were at an SDOT meeting here. And we had the community come in and just tell us what they wanted. As you see from the sign, some said we want 25 per miles per hour in certain areas. Some said we wanted 20. But overall, everybody wanted a safe greater avenue. And there's more support. Support just kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. Okay. So in order to do a lot of this work, of course, we had a very very uh, fixed campaign plan that we were following. We had media outreach at all of these events. We had uh, kind of a targeted uh, set of city politicians and uh, people in city government and uh, the, the Department of Transportation that we wanted to influence to actually fix this sick street. Uh, while it seems like a no-brainer, of course you would fix it, it turns out that you know budget priorities sometimes don't go to the places that you want them to go. And so all of our campaign was about how we could get Rainier Avenue South, and actually we have some other streets in that in that area too, uh, fixed so that they can actually serve the people who need to, to walk in those places, the people that need to cross the street in a dignified way to get to transit, people who really need to, to, to live there and build a community there. So a lot of our work has been focused on bringing those community members together and, and educating them about safe streets generally. We won. Yay! 2015. Yay! Yeah. August was last year. We heard the drilling in the street. We saw the Seattle Department of Transportation trucks among Rainier Avenue. I was so happy I went out and said, hello. Thank you. I thought they probably thought I was crazy. But I had a great time greeting men, and they've done a remarkable job over the one mile. And Kathy's going to talk to you about some of what we had within that one mile of improvement. So what we got funded was a mile of the four mile long stretch of Seattle's most dangerous street. So it was a pilot project to look at what the safety rechannelization project would actually change. And it turned out that it really was a, a very effective project. Uh, the speeds were lowered to 25 miles an hour with, with these safety improvements. Uh, signals timing was changed too. That was that actually turned out to be a really big thing. and I. I suggest that you look at that in your own communities because in the low-income communities that we've, we've studied, uh, signal timing is actually favoring the arterial rather than favoring people getting across the street. That's not true in high-income communities. Mm -hmm. So there's less time to get across the street. So when people in Rainier Valley were saying, we have to run across the street to get across the street, it was really true that we're running across the street because signal timing didn't favor people walking. So something to look at in all of your cities. Uh, but there were longer pedestrian, the signals were retimed, uh, and pedestrian interval signals were added. And the, the, uh, the big thing, the big, big result was that it really didn't slow traffic speed down at all. In fact, in some cases, it increased uh, this, the, the flow of, of traffic actually getting through, the traffic speed and volume going through intersections because there was not crazy speeding, there were not the number, well, let's see if we have this. There were not the number of collisions, so there weren't these horrible accidents, these horrible collisions happening that caused traffic to slow down. Uh, so, you know, walk bike injuries are down in this pilot area, a whopping 40%. It's huge. Uh, and the top end speeding, of course, has been reduced quite a bit. So, simple, very simple. Uh, road rechannelization changes have resulted in massive, massive changes. And you would think that with this incredibly successful pilot that we wouldn't have to keep on advocating. But it turns out that we do. <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable to us as an advocacy organization, and probably you too, right? Right, right. So you know, you, they give us a little bit, but that doesn't stop us. We did want to make sure that they did follow through on everything so we've been there to make sure. And so in order to get more, we thought we'd thank them first. So we decided to have a two-part campaign. Like, let's thank the city for all the work that they've done. Let's make another card thanking the mayor and thanking our district council member 
And which we did, we made this really great large card, we had the community sign it, and we invited, we invited them out. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, the, the council member couldn't make it, but he did send a representative with a statement showing that he does actually support us and that we will be going forward with the extension. But at the end of that, you know, after we said thank you, thank you, thank you, we had a chat. Let me tell you our chat. Our first chat when we walked back and forth across the street was, what do you want? Save streets. When do you want them now? Say it with me. What do you want? Save streets. When do you want them now? Okay, we got that. We got the one body, right? So when we went back this time, we said our mayor is Mayor Murray and the council member is Harold. So we said, thank you, Harold. Thank you, Murray. Safe streets now. We're in a hurry. <laughs> so it worked. We had a great turnout. We had a great turnout with the community. And we have a video which should be coming up next. It's not all full of, we, you know, we have to condense it just for you guys. And we had community members. It's a great thing. We had community members from each one of the areas come in and they spoke to let us. One mile safer, three to go. One mile safer, three to go. One mile safer. So today we're here. We're asking for an extension of the project. We want. We've gone one mile. We have three miles to go. But as you can see, not only with the traffic, but with all of the wonderful businesses in Sewer Park or in uh, Columbia City, uh, that this is something that's very necessary. So thanks again, and I look forward to an expansion of this. My name is Guy Davis. I'm the president of the Columbia City Business Association. And I can say that on behalf of the Business Association, we are very happy with the changes that have happened here on Rainier Avenue. As you can see right now, all these cars are moving so much slower through the intersection and they continue to move slowly through Columbia City, which is really important because this is a community of people who want to be here. Uh, so we believe that if we get safe transportation, that that's going to contribute to the continuing decrease in crime in our neighborhood. And so we are thrilled to hear about the endorsements from the communities here because that's what we want in Rainier Beach and you'll be able to contribute with your success to the success that we have in our neighborhood. We have a community here in Rainier Valley that is bisected by the most dangerous street in the city and more and more people are living here and it's time uh, and it's time and it's time to see the city coming forward and actually recognizing that this is going to be a community where not just cars are going to be accommodated, but people and bicyclists and families. The data we have received at this point has been very positive and moving forward. I believe it is time to push toward completing the next three miles of this project. The council budget period is coming here in the next few weeks and we will continue to advocate to make our streets safer. One of the primary goals of the Rainier Beach Merchants Association is to promote the general welfare of Rainier Beach neighborhood, both business and residential. They believe that if they expand the Rainier Beach Safety Corridor Project, it would do just that. I'm really excited that I had the opportunity to advocate for a voice in a community that normally would not have a voice. Thank you. What I'd like you to do is to repeat after me. Rainier Valley. Rainier Valley. Greenways. Greenways. Rainier Valley. Rainier Valley. Greenways. Greenways. One more time. Rainier Valley. Rainier Valley. Greenways. Greenways. All right. Give yourself a hand there, okay? So if you and your chant are as committed as your chant suggests, yeah. So we're thrilled, but as I said, we're still advocating. We expect the city will fund a complete improvement. Okay, just from, from that night, that day, that afternoon, here are some of the people that came out just to help support. Here's the sign that we had thanking the mayor and thanking the council member. Next slide, let's see. And again, one more, one mile safer, more to go, three to go. And just a list of all the collaboration that we had in the community that reached out. We reached out to them and they reached back in return to offer their support. And also, quite as you see, quite a few of those uh, organizations did come out and talk with us that, that evening. And, and something of, of note, too, it's the business community that really supports these safer streets. I think once they understand, you know, people in local businesses, once they understand that a safer street means more people 
coming to the business areas, they're, they're some of the biggest boosters of, of the work that we're doing in outreach for, for uh, rechannelizing the street. And that, in turn, influences the politicians that make the, the funding decisions. So that, that's been a big takeaway with that. And here, building the relationships, we actually, these are the parents, the first step, with dear precious, dear, I love prayers. This is the seven-year-old uh, girl who was, struck, who was struck by the car. This is her family. They all came out in support. We had a vigil for her. Also, we had a solutions meeting where we had the mayor, and we had uh, district council and other local community leaders come out. And the family had the opportunity to speak. Some of these people have never spoken or interacted with city government before. Mm -hmm. So it was great actually seeing that Ethiopian and the, uh, the Ethiopian community come out. And we also had the Somali community. We talked with them also about getting support in their community. So now we have some su su successful outcomes that Kathy's going to talk a little bit about with ongoing questions. So at the beginning of this session, uh, I've distributed, and Phyllis distributed some questions that have come up during our outreach to this very low-income community and making safety changes to them. If you don't have a copy of them, I think there are a couple, couple extra ones up here. Um, but Phyllis and I have talked about some of these questions, and we've tried to answer some of these questions, but I'd like to get a lot of feedback from the audience, from you guys at this point. Um, they're not questions that we're going to come up with answers to in this session, but I think it's important that we actually acknowledge them and talk about them because they're questions that we have and I think they're going to be ongoing questions for, for talking to low-income communities in particular uh, about enforcement, about um, balancing safety, uh, about uh, gentrification and also about outreach to people that traditionally don't have a voice in city government. So um, we can go through the, the questions that are on this sheet. I mean, Phyllis, do you want to read the first one? Okay, the first one talks about traffic enforcement, citations, and fines. Uh, these may detour poor choices, but they also allow an equitable policing. How can traffic balance be deterred without increasing driving while black forms of ticketing? It's a question more. So does the Seattle um, Police Department already, are they doing anything about like informing officers about bias and, and kind of already working on this policing issue? Uh, absolutely, know? but I think it's it's a it's a many year process. Yes. Uh, but yes, they are they are talking about that right now. And and part of this project too was supposed to be an enforcement part, part of the pilot project, the one year pilot. We didn't notice a huge increase in enforcement. But we do have some ideas about uh, traffic enforcement that might be more equitable that we might want to share. But you want to talk about that? I think maybe when it first started, I did look at like every day for about a couple of weeks. I saw police cars. I saw cars pulling people over, giving tickets. And then slowly after that, you would see that kind of go away. And so both Kathy and I, we met with uh, not the chief of police, but the person, chief, chief, chief. deputy um, of police. And we talked with her about getting more enforcement. And some of the concerns that they have was policing. You know, if you go to a community and the community is basically uh, of the socioeconomic level, it's a lot less than some of the other areas. You really have to be careful because people in the community think you just have police. The police is going to be out here just ticketing us. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of jobs, and we can't afford to ticket. But at the same time, if you live in a community and you're breaking the law, breaking the law is breaking the law. So the balance, so there has to be a balance in there somehow, and that's some of the setback that we're having. But like we said, conversations are going on. Can, can real fast, I just want to say just three things that Phyllis and I talked about, mm -hmm. that, about discussion uh, about how to more equitably enforce. Uh, one was uh, a, a lesson from uh, Scandinavia where people are given, I think it's in Denmark, where they're given a percentage of their income as their as their fine. fine. Yeah. So if you're a person who makes $10,000 a year, you might have a fine of $25, which is meaningful. But if you're a person that makes $100,000 a year, you might have a fine that's $250, which is meaningful. So it's it's based on income. It's a hard thing to do. Seattle is uh, also a town that has restorative justice. A lot of that is happening right now, where there's kind of elders who 
talk to people who have made mistakes and try to look at equitable solutions to those mistakes. And then finally, this is a, an example from Finland, which I absolutely love, which is uh, people who speed in school zones have to go in and talk to the children in the school where they've been speeding. Wow. <laughs> which is a kind of restorative justice. Right? <laughs> so, so people had their hands up about this in pretty a lot of so. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if there was conversation and discussion about using uh, speed cameras as a method of enforcement instead of putting uh, actual sure. police officers on the street. Yes, there has been talk about the speed cameras, but again, um, it still comes back if you put speed cameras up in those areas too, pretty much the same problem you would have but if you were just act like there are no cars stopping and giving that same particular person a ticket. So all that is still up under trying to find that balance. Yes. Uh, well, I think that I think there's there's two 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 parts to the answer to that question. One is that um, I, I don't agree that all laws need to be uh, enforced equally, uh, in the in that there's a huge difference between somebody going 50 miles an hour down a 25 mile an hour street and somebody that's going 25 miles an hour down that street with a broken taillight. So uh, the the research shows that speed is what kills people. So I think if, if A, if the police are going to enforce, uh, which is still an open question, I think, um, then they need to be enforcing the speeding and let the stuff that really doesn't endanger people's lives maybe go. And the, and the second thing is that um, we really shouldn't be building streets so that the police have to enforce 50 mile an hour speeding right. on a 25 mile an hour street. Right. You know, the police are really, the, the reason why I think people start distrusting the police is because they are asked to change human behavior that shouldn't have been allowed to start in the first place. Absolutely. So there were some other hands up? Uh, uh, I'm from Tampa, Florida. We had another kind of enforcement uh, challenge in our community where uh, there was um, uh, an, a disproportionate amount of tickets and citations being issued to people of color for uh, not riding their bikes correctly or not mm -hmm. having lighting mm -hmm. and it was um, considered by many to be um, uh, just a, a means of looking for other opportunities to enforce uh, you know other other laws mm -hmm. at the same time and so now that we're trying to encourage uh, cycling behavior that is um, improved in all areas in conjunction with roadways that are made safer how do we? Do you have any advice on how we would kind of overcome that legacy of the um, the community feeling like that those folks are targeted and you know how do we how do we grapple with that kind of? Yeah, that's a great question. Because we, we need everybody to we need all all the roadway users to comply, mm -hmm. um, hopefully through you know, behavior modification that is just logical. I mean, I, I think kind of having dialogue with your, mm -hmm. with your enforcing people and yeah. the, the politicians, mm -hmm. and then also I think that this, this fellow's point back here is that you actually want to engineer for safe streets ultimately. Right. And, and that, that's all, you know, ultimately where, where we're going, which I actually um, want to get into in kind of some, our, our later questions. Uh, I, I just want to kind of go through them because I want to get, get a little bit of a discussion. Do you have, yeah. <laughs> Um, clarifying question, what's the average daily traffic prior to the regionalization and what was the posted speed prior to the change? So it stayed the same, the, the average daily traffic. It was, uh, I think it was 23,000. It was just at the kind of the, the cutoff point where there could be uh, road regionalization. And uh, then the, um, the, the ADT uh, was, uh, I think it started at 30 and it, and it has, and it's still, it, it's, it's 20, 20, it's 25, it's but we wanted to put it at 20 in, in the kind of the business community. So do you want to ask the next? Okay, the next question is number two. Yeah. What are some good tools and some common pitfalls for doing outreach to traffic safety and place making to businesses that are owned by immigrants and minority communities? And you can answer, start to answer this because you've done a lot of that. We've had, down in the south end of Seattle, we've come up with different ideas. One idea that we came up with for place making uh, in the Hillman City area, there's many, but I'm just going to say this because it's sticking out. Uh, at one of our local cafes, uh, they open up um, 
what do you call it? A parklet. And open up a parklet. So once you exit out of the cafe, the, the cafe there's this little parklet right there, partially in the street, up against the sidewalk. So now this will attract, number one, it's going to slow the traffic down because it's somewhat on the sidewalk and somewhat in the street. So if cars come down, you know, they have to slow down and move over. And then it also brings the community, it brings your community out to where they can actually sit and they can enjoy the community a little bit more. So that's just one of the many. Um, some of the others, uh, there's been quite a few. We're well, just talking to people for a long time, too. I mean, I think that's the, that's the biggest oh, dialogue. Thing. Dialogue, just getting the community out and talking to people. And it, it isn't just talking to people. I mean, Phyllis and I have been talking to people year after year after year. It takes a long time to build trust in community. Where, and then you actually have to deliver. I think that the trust doesn't happen just by talking. Right, that's really great. Because when we first started Greenways, when I first started to uh, work with the Greenway Coalition, uh, I would go out from door to door in this community, knock on the door, door to door, and tell people what we are doing. And I wanted to hear from them, what, are you, what would you like to see? I even took maps. Mark the problem in your area. Mark it on this map. We took that information back. Some people we heard from from this one particular person, he kept saying, okay, we're going to work with you, we're going to work with you. And we never did anything until the seven-year-old girl was hit. It happened to be his sister. And when that happened, when I was looking for someone to talk to, I was connected to him, found out it was his sister. He found out it was me who was doing the helping with the vigil. And since then, the community, we have things, the community come out. So talking to the people and delivering, being incredible. I'm going to just take one question for this one because I, I, it turns out we just have a few minutes left and I really want to get to question number three which we have no answers to. So. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I, was, I just wanted to say that um, Seattle is having parking day on Friday and it's free. Anybody can go and make a parklet. And, you know, parklets are very expensive in Seattle. So you have to be a pretty up and coming uh, company. But uh, there's only 50 little groups that are making their own whatever they want. They have a chess board and they can take over a couple of car stalls. Parking What's it stalls. called? It's parking called Parking Day. Is this right? We're in front of the city hospital. You want to come join us? That would be great. We also want to get a, a protected bike lane. So we've had more of a protected bike lane. We did, we did 2,000 feet of protected bike lane on last years parking day so we're, we're all over parking yeah. day. <laughs> we love it and this third question she wanted us to make sure we got given a choice of a variety of engineering improvements in low-income areas uh, it says more reliable transit road channelization better sidewalks and signals protected bike lanes safer routes to school it said which might serve low-income communities best and and building protected bike lanes and new sidewalks can be seen as a form of what gentrification anytime you come in with bringing in a bike lane, changing the sidewalk, the community thinks, okay, it's gentrification and not about safety first. So if we can have a conversation about safety first, we don't know what that outcome may be. It may be better than what we're doing now. So what are some ideas for traffic, uh, di different kinds of traffic engineering that actually don't displace communities? So that's the one we don't have an answer to, so bring it on. Yes? Of course, probably everyone in here knows that you know it's, we still don't know like is it really just a symptom of gentrification versus a cause. But I think a really good approach is what you guys did already is rather than coming in and having the, the charrette and saying we're going to put this in here, is coming to these communities and saying what are your needs and your issues and whatever. And a lot of times you get to those same solutions because it is about safety. But I think rather than saying, no, we're going to come put our bike lanes right through your... I mean, I'm from Portland, which of course has yeah. seen some huge tensions in that area. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the stuff that's learned is, like, no, we really need to go and listen. And as, especially as traffic engineers and planners, I've learned to listen. Mm -hmm. so. I think if you start with putting the community around safety mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. then it may give it for us and help us with this. Back there. Yeah, another another example, like in, in White Center along the 15th Avenue Greenway, there's lower impact traffic calming devices like speed humps, for example, as opposed to like installing a complete bike lane. Uh, so you, instead of engineering in a bike lane, you engineer down the speed of traffic. And there, and there, ha and there hasn't been a lot, and there have been along that corridor. There hasn't been a lot of resistance, and there hasn't been a lot of, um, you know, consternation by the, by the, by those residents about those um, speed humps and improvements being made. And also, also towards that point of rechannelization or rechannelizing or um, redirecting stops 
they, once they redirect and stops on the crossing as opposed to down the arterial um, for off for automobiles for stop signs as opposed to stop lights. So. Those, those are all good points. Uh, something that we're focusing on as an organization now is engineering for safe routes to school too because that tends to be in a very local community and it's something that sort of everybody can get behind. So we're working with the lowest income schools in Seattle, Ramju here with the video cameras. Working on safe routes to school um, and um, it, it's something that, that a lot of the community can get behind and it doesn't um, end up gentrifying I think as much as, as other projects. So. And then back there. Yeah, so we uh, run into many of these same issues all the time in Chicago. Um, as advocates, and in terms of particular types of infrastructure, one thing we do often for traffic calming is uh, refuge islands um, to control speeds, and they don't have that same uh, stigma uh, of a bike lane or even a sidewalk. And then also looking at a, a comprehensive streetscaping project as opposed to just doing a, a bike lane or an individual piece of infrastructure. So you can look at landscaping, you can look at lighting. Many of these communities are concerned, rightfully so, about disinvestment and public safety. So if you could include um, you know, public space benefits, lighting, it, then they're more likely to embrace the project. And then back um, one thing that I've read that's very effective and low cost um, in terms of that crosswalks to in crosswalk signs, literally putting them in the road, you know, you see the, the yields of pedestrian signs. Um, very affordable, and in terms of signage, they're the most effective, from what I understand. So you could put that in the like the commercial quarter, probably in the, the where all the businesses are, and that would probably be a good. So that actually kind of segues these last two questions to the the final question, which is um, that these these high impact uh, corridors with a very high injury rate are disproportionately located in low-income communities mm -hmm. and how do we make equity investments and how much of our budget should be going uh, toward, towards uh, these neglected areas. So thoughts about that as well? Yeah, back there Dave. Well, I think the largest opportunity uh, for those major arterials is partnering with transit and not having a project appear, even though it may be more efficient, of uh, you can slow the traffic on an arterial and get more people down effectively. So from a safety perspective, you if you bring in transit and mobility, you have other uh, federally funding, federal funding opportunities. So it may not be a huge push for matching dollars for the DOT, but to work with a local transit agency and open up for federal dollars. Here and then over there. Sort of touching on 3 in Port, um, I work in Vancouver, Washington, um, which is a suburb of Portland, and um, I work in the Fourth Plain Corridor, which is lowest income and most diverse part of the city, also the highest collision rates in the city. And, um, we have a BRT system that will open in just a few months there. And so in advance of that, worried about displacement of low-income and minority-owned businesses, we started a technical assistance program um, years in advance of the BRT opening mm -hmm. to go in and help businesses um, you know, understand about, um, how to take advantage of that and what might the risks be and what's your business plan look like now. And we hired mm -hmm. folks who were from the communities that existed there to do that work, hmm. we have no idea if it worked yet, because VRT will open in um, just a few months, but we're hoping that trying to shore up those folks in advance means they can really benefit from the hmm. investment and not be pushed out, you know, so. Great. I guess uh, there have been issues in Seattle with other places that have a higher tax base, a higher uh, property tax base taking issue with money being spent in Rainier Valley? And how and, how, and then how, how, how has this project addressed those uh, concerns of those groups? So so can you reframe that? How, so ha, has this project, you know, the one in the one mile, has there been pushback from uh, other areas of the city that have a higher tax base against 
Rather the generalizations in general, or no, no, against this, against this one specifically. specifically well, well, so, so all, all of the the uh, the high impact corridors in Seattle actually are are graded, mm -hmm. uh, and from you know very worst, which actually happens to be Rainier Avenue South, mm -hmm. to just terrible, and uh, so some of the, the 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 just terribles are you know rated for for rotary channelizations uh, in the you know, nine or ten, and they're still just terrible, but a lot of those happen to be in higher income areas, and so there is pushback. I mean, everybody wants their street safer. You know, everybody who lives in a, in a dense urban place wants traffic. Actually, today, the yeah. legislation today dropped in Seattle uh, that is going to have 20 mile an hour on all neighborhood streets and 25 default on arterials if, if warranted. So it's a really big piece of legislation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually, it hasn't officially dropped yet, but so we're not supposed to really say that. But we have been, we have been advocating for that for like the last three years. It is the most exciting work that we've done. But, but yeah, I mean, I think everybody wants their streets engineered to a, a livable speed. And Dave, Dave, did you have back there, Dave Rogers? No, I was, I was going to address that. Historically, what we've done with cities is we've pushed these major arterials through to the 50s, 60s, 70s through uh, low-income areas, yes. and we, mm -hmm. the roads are there and the communities are there. So there's not a pushback to say don't fix that road. There's actually in the um, in the more affluent parts of Seattle, they don't want their road repaved because they might get bike lanes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're basically That's saying. Exactly. <laughs> and, and from the matching grant, uh, they're going through doing a data, uh, there's a matching grant process, and uh, I think it's 83% uh, of the large matching grant projects actually have gone to South East Seattle. So the matching grant program itself, for as, large as, as for large projects, works okay. But it's, uh, yeah, we're dealing with what we've done in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and how do we do it without, uh, how, do we, how do we become safe without destroying the existing fabric of those neighborhoods. And many of those streets actually turned out to be uh, state highways that have been sort of deaccession to the city's ownership, and that that's another layer of complexity, especially if they still are state highways. There was one more comment, and I think then we're going to wrap up and take questions uh, one on one. <laughs> um, I'm from St. Paul and Minnesota, and um, working on a project very similar situation. And um, part of the equity question that I have is um, the proposed road project that's going to be done um, is in a, a neighborhood that is highly transit dependent. A lot of households without vehicles, like getting up into the 50% of the households without vehicles. And the proportion of money in the project that's allocated to the road versus allocated to improving the um, the sidewalks and the streetscape and the other um, amenities or engineering things that would slow down the traffic is not proportionate. And it, has anyone encountered that um, situation or, I don't know, just... Well, I think, think you know, our Scandinavian and Dutch neighbors probably are, are investing more proportionately to actually use who the roadway users are. I don't think, I can't think of an American example of cities investing proportionately to who the roadway users are yet. Can you? Anyone? But that's what we're all working towards. I mean, I think that's why we're here at this conference is that that's where we're, that's where we're headed. I mean, it, you know, it is about the money. Well, actually, I think you need to decide who you want to accommodate and accommodate them because that's a double-edged sword. I mean, there are places in the city where I live where there are basically no pedestrians because there are no accommodations. Mm -hmm. the distances are great. So if you use that logic, then we don't need to spend any money because they're not there yet. But you don't measure the demand for a swimming pool by how many people are sitting around. But this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is based on the number of pedestrians that pedestrians are out okay. there. It's, it's the number of households. Oh. If you look at the number of households without vehicles. Mm -hmm. Who is that road really serving, and you know, what what should the design be? Is kind of the issue that I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more, one more. I just want to say that we have to also note that Light Lake came right through this 
uh, Rainier Ave and Columbia City, and the city of Seattle invests a lot of money in that wonderful you know, alternative transportation. I mean, I don't know if a lot of these people know that. Right, it's, 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 it's surface so, transportation, uh, yeah. light rail, which I think the community actually wanted not to be surface light rail. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's so much cheaper to go directly up I, you know, follow I-5 than it did that went around. Right, and it does, yeah, it's actually caused a lot of traffic injuries because it's on the surface. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but thank you very much for coming to the session. Thank you.